get back It resides between my eyes Walk through the fire Came out better on the other side See lights like a beach If you find the sand And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise All right <laughs> Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Baby Einstein, Atari, and many more, and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today, I'm excited. We have Dory Clark. She's a top strategy consultant. She's worked with clients including Google, Microsoft, Morgan Stanley, and many more. She teaches for Duke University at the Business School and has lectured at Harvard Business School, Stanford, MIT, and a long list of others. She's the author of Reinventing You, and her latest book is Stand Out, How to Find Your Breakthrough Idea and Build the Following Around It. Dory, thanks for joining me. Hey, Jeremy. Thanks. I'm really glad to speak with you. Everyone wants that. Everyone wants exactly that. And, you know, when I read this, how long did it take you? Like, I have to read the subheadline because it probably took you a long time to figure out what that was. How long does it take you to figure out, okay, my subheadline headline has to be how to find your breakthrough idea and build a following around it? Well, we, we had... Um we had a little bit of a, a fight about it occasionally. Uh, I like to hear about the fights. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know, so so sometimes it's uh, it's the cover, sometimes it's the the headline, um, but there, there's always little squabbles between the, the author and the publisher. Yeah. And they wanted to call it "How to Find Your Big Idea," and I was I was sort of resistant to that because I, I I felt like you know yeah a big idea is good, but it to me it made it sound a little a little bit shallow. Mm-hmm. And, you know, like, oh, it's a big idea. And, you know, it's like, no, no, I don't want it to just to just be that. I want it to be a, about breakthrough ideas, about ideas yeah. that actually are game changers in some way for yeah. for you and for your career yeah. and for hopefully your company and your field. So I uh, I didn't have a good alternative to finding your big idea. And I had to uh, to really sort of marinate on it for a while. But then one day breakthrough uh, came to me and and I put it forward and they actually liked it so I was really pleased with how it came out. I like to hear the behind the scenes and I could I could tell a lot of thought went into that so I had to ask that and you know I have to mention I did listen to Stand Out twice it's phenomenal I recommend people get it and also you do have a special assessment tool can you just tell people where they can find that? Yeah, thank you, Jeremy. On my website uh, doryclark.com, which is D O R I E C L A R K. Um, folks can download a free 42 page workbook that yeah. I adapted from Standout that actually walks people through the process of how to develop their own breakthrough ideas and build a following around them. So I hope some folks might uh, might get some some inspiration from it. Yeah. And so talk about that for a second, because, you know, a lot of people have listened to it, read it. Um, what are some of the success stories? What have you heard from people who've listened to the book and what they've done? Yeah, so in terms of in terms of success stories uh, from from standout, I, I've heard from a lot of people who are uh, consultants, authors, uh, entrepreneurs that it, it it in a lot of ways accomplished what I was hoping it would do, yeah. which is present people with a smorgasbord of options. I mean, yeah. this is this is not um, you know it, it's two hundred fifty pages of a lot of possibilities and information. It would probably kill you if you tried to do all of them. And so yeah. what I wanted to do... You can take bits and pieces. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. give one of the... I mean, personally, I'll tell you what I love because um, I can be a little introverted when it comes to conferences. I like there's some technique. I think you quoted Richard Wiseman talking about choosing people um, with a different... who are wearing something different or a different color to talk to. So it kind of gives you uh, something to follow you know, in a group setting like that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, really, it's just about, you know, picking, picking uh, role models and inspirations from the stories about things that, that feel relevant to you. So I've heard from a lot of people, for instance, that, um, that reading Standout helped them get a lot more serious about, uh, about writing blogs, for instance. Mm. That was something that they knew that they wanted to do, but mm-hmm. they just hadn't kind of had a kick in the pants about it. But that that showed them the importance and where it could actually mm. help lead their career and build their platform. Um, so that was exciting. And, you know, Stand Out, or, or sorry, Reinventing You, my first book, has been out for a couple of years. And yeah. so that, I, I've had the opportunity to have a fair number of case studies sort yeah. of roll in the door. And, What's one uh, of your and, favorites from Reinventing You? 
You know, one guy who's actually become uh, become a friend, I've met up with him a couple of times, is this Australian guy. Uh, his name is Blair Hughes, and he actually did something amazing. He was working as a school teacher in Australia, and he was just he was not really happy with it, and he wanted to uh, to get into marketing, and in particular sports marketing. That was what he was really into, and so he used reinventing you as a template, and he just created this like life plan for himself that he's been operationalizing over the past two years. And he's managed to, to get a, a, a six-figure job now for himself. Oh. And uh, he's working, doing marketing for this really cool company, which enables him to liaise with all these sports teams. He's lost a bunch of weight and gotten healthy. Wow. Like he, he, uh, he really reinvented himself. <laughs> he went nuts with it, which has been really fantastic. Yeah. Um, there's another guy, uh, actually, who, uh, who wrote to me um, who decided – that, that he wanted to get um, more involved in content creation as a result of, uh, of reading Reinventing You. And uh, so he's been blogging really regularly. And uh, I actually just introduced him to my editor at Forbes. Mm. And, uh, and the editor at Forbes is interested in possibly working with him. So, you know, he's somebody who's been following the, the template. And, you know, it's, it's led him to some exciting places that he couldn't necessarily have predicted at the, uh, at the outset. Yeah, and I have a bunch of questions. I like to hear your mindset and your behind the scenes, what goes on at Standout. And you know, I was looking, there was one sentence that really stuck out in the whole book for me. And it seems like we have two common loves. Maybe love's a little bit strong, strong a word. Um, but one is um, spaghetti. Um, there's one sentence in here I have to hear about. Um, you have these spaghetti dinners and you'll cook spaghetti for people, I think, if I'm correct. And then the second is John Corcoran. So I want to talk about those, um, but talk about the spaghetti dinner. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I want to so have a cook off against you. When we're in the same city, we'll both <laughs> present our spaghetti uh, sauce in dish. Yes. So tell me about one of those, uh, the most memorable dinner. That that sounds like a that sounds like an excellent idea. I have a feeling you probably are gonna smoke me. I don't think but, so. No. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, so so to be fair, I've, so for about. 18 months or so, basically ever since I moved to New York, yeah. about twice a month, sometimes actually e even more, sometimes three or even four times a month. So yeah. it's pretty regular. I will have dinners where I invite groups of people together. Right. Um, usually every month it is uh, a specially themed author's dinner to bring mm. uh, authors and people from the media and publishing world together. Yeah. The rest of the time it's like a random mix of people yeah. um so just people that i think would like to know each other right. um people that that you know some it's some are folks that i know some are folks that i don't occasionally what i will do is i will pick a co-host oftentimes it's actually our, our other, other mutual friend michael roderick michael's and amazing i love michael yeah he's great and so i'll i'll invite half the people and he invites half the people so then we have our our groups mixing which is uh, which is really fun so and you guys know everyone in new york city probably between the two of you <laughs> we've we've made good progress yeah the the one the one asterisk on this is that after um after a few spaghetti dinners I came to realize something, which is that the modern era of dietary restrictions mm. has kind of um, has kind of uh, killed the dinner party, and so people are uh, gluten free, like dairy free, co like all the yeah everything, everything. Yeah. So I had one <laughs> dinner, and I and I announced in advance. I'm like, okay, this is a spaghetti dinner. It's vegetarian. Like I thought, like okay, that that's that's got to take care of most of it, right? No. This is a dinner for six people, and yet still one is vegan, and one who gets invited at the last minute is gluten free. I'm like, it's spaghetti. <laughs> so, uh, so that was that was very complicated. So after after that, I, I thought, all right, you know what? I'm gonna have these at a restaurant. So I've mostly moved my uh, my dinner operations to uh, to a, a particular restaurant that I just kind of have a system worked out with, and I do it mm. with them every time. Uh, and that actually has gone really well. But uh, but I've been keeping it up pretty consistently for about a year and a half. And you do two a month. Uh, usually it's an average of two a month, but mm. if I'm going to wow. be traveling a lot the next month, yeah. I will actually double up. And so wow, sometimes really? I've done it as often as like every week. Yeah. So what's been one of the most memorable? dinners that you had oh there are some really fun ones i mean gosh um i i had one dinner um earlier in the year it was in the winter it was still cold maybe it was february or march something like that and uh, it was just a, a really fun group of uh, of interesting people probably 
uh, probably some of them that you know. Um, James Altucher and his wife Claudia were there, mm-hmm. and uh, uh, A.J. Jacobs, um, who wrote the the Year of Living sure. Biblically. Yeah, yeah. Um, he was he was one of the people who was nice enough to blurb stand out actually. Um, a friend of mine who is a producer at MSNBC, and that worked really well because the MSNBC producer hadn't heard about AJ's, uh, you know, world's largest family reunion he was doing. Right. And so he found out about that and he's like, oh, good, we'll, we'll cover that. And so uh, AJ was able some to get really some cool coverage stuff, out yeah. of that. Um, Derek Halpern, who does a lot of online marketing, was there. Uh, yeah, just, you know, just a neat, uh, a neat mix of people. Very cool. And um, so John Corcoran. So what made you decide to include him in the book? Oh, John. You know, I think John I called is, him. I didn't want to get his head too big, but I go, John, just so you know, I just listened to Stand Out, and I think you're in half the book. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, John John is a great case study. I mean, he's he's somebody, and, you know, he uh, he will, you know, share these stories on his, uh, on his email list, which is very, you know, fun. You know, he's a great writer, of course, so yeah. his messages are always very engaging, and he talks a lot about the things that he's done in the past couple of years. But I met John in january of 2013 which is actually kind of like the point where he sort of i think dates his personal transformation quote unquote too Mm -hmm. where he decided to sort of get serious about Mm -hmm. learning about marketing and you know creating his own business and things like that but really just at the beginning of the year right after the new year i was at nmx the uh, new media expo in las vegas and i went and john introduced himself to me and you know he seemed he seemed like a nice guy he seemed friendly and um He'd clearly like, you know, done his homework. Like he knew who I was. He had like certain things to talk about with me. Um, you know, he had been a volunteer on a campaign that I had worked on. So, yeah. you know, we were able to have a good conversation. And so he um, he invited me to be a guest on his podcast. So mm-hmm. I said, sure. So that was a good method for our staying in touch and yeah. gave us an excuse to kind of connect further because my book was coming out. So I appreciated that. And so I just, I liked him. He seemed like a nice guy. And so I tried to be helpful to him after that, um, you know, doing a couple of posts with him with Forbes and then introducing him to my editor at Forbes. Uh, so, you know, we just continued the connection. But uh, John, over time, as I got to know him, I, I really came to realize that he's, you know, somebody who's both very nice and very talented. And in the course of, uh, of researching Stand Out, one of the things that I wanted to do was in addition to profiling these kind of, um, you know, high profile, you know, quote unquote, superstars in their industry. Yeah. Um, Cialdini, Seth Godin, you mentioned. Yeah. 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 David Allen, Dan yeah. Pink, things like that. Yeah. Um, you want to have a balance in your book between, you know, what the what the sort of super famous people are doing and what the more, quote unquote, regular people are doing. Right. Because you, you know, as I have discovered, um, people relate need, to it. Yeah. yeah, people need to feel like it's attainable. Yeah. And so John was somebody who I thought was a very relatable character. You know, he was a guy at the point when I interviewed him, that was like January of 2014. So he had basically spent about a year at that point building his his business and had hit on a pretty good strategy for himself. And especially because Dan Pink was one of the celebrities that I interviewed for the mm. book, I thought it was a nice counterpoint because yeah. here's a guy, you know, a regular guy who really wants to meet Dan Pink. And so how do you do it? I, I think a lot of people are in that situation. Like, right. oh, I wish I could connect with that person, but I don't know how. Yeah. And John was able to solve the problem with aplomb and, uh, you know, through through his podcast. And uh, and I thought, oh, that's that's great. You know, I'll, I'll profile him as, as kind of one of the strategies that you can yeah. use. Yeah. So I have a couple fun facts about you. I always like to make it a little personal. People get to know Dory a little bit. And uh, one is you're a vegetarian since 13. So you were ahead of the trend for everyone. And <laughs> two, I, I had written down um, at age 14, you went to a program for exceptionally gifted uh, students. Yes, so what yes. Were, yeah, tell me about that. Like, what was life like in small town North Carolina? Well, you know, it was. I grew up in this little town called Pinehurst, yeah. which uh, some of your listeners will know is a famous golf resort. That's why and it sounds so, familiar. Yes. Yeah. So it's. <laughs> So in, in some ways, I mean, it was a very small town when I was growing up. It was it was about 3,000 people. Yeah. Um, but it was, uh, you know, in, in other ways, it was this kind of coveted community. Like, if you're a golfer, it's like, oh, Pinehurst. Wouldn't that be amazing to be from Pinehurst? Um, but if you're not a golfer and if you're, Like myself, you know, yeah. <laughs> yeah, if, if you're this, like, kid that wants to, 
you know, essentially do what I'm doing now, which is like yeah. live in New York City and have dinner parties. Pinehurst was not the place that you wanted to grow up. So yeah. I tried to scheme as much as possible to uh, to find ways to to get out and to extricate yeah. myself very quickly. So, Dory, what did you want to be when you grew up at that time? Well, you know, when I um, when I was young, what I wanted when I was like, you know, five or seven or whatever, mm. what I wanted to be was a spy. I basically really? wanted to be James Bond. Yeah, I mm. thought that was awesome. Um, then as I got a little bit older, um, I thought I wanted to be a lawyer. <laughs> really, you know, exciting. Go from being a spy to being a lawyer. Um, <laughs> right. But by the time I was leaving for college, you know, when I was a when I was a young teenager, yeah. um, I, you know, I had come out at that point, and so what I really wanted to be was like a professional gay activist because really? I was I was very um, opinionated as a teenager. <laughs> so most you know, teenagers, it, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, so if you're if you're a really opinionated teenager who you know believes that you're always right, like what would be better than getting paid to be a professional activist? So that was uh, that was something that I was grooving on for quite a while. Who'd you look and, up to? Is there someone that you like? I want to be. That? I mean, obviously, like the spy thing, the James Bond, the activist thing. Was there someone I want to be them? Well, you know, I would I would read. Um, there was not a lot of information when when I was a kid. You know, this is this is like you know twenty plus years ago. Right. Um, you know, there was not Will and Grace or Ellen or whatever. I mean, there was not a lot of public discussion about I see, gay yeah, issues. Yeah. And uh, and so I didn't. You know, until until I was already out for a year, I literally didn't know any other gay people. Just not at all. And so. Um, the way, the only way that I kind of got information for a while until I went off to college was subscribing to magazines. And so I subscribed to the advocate Hmm. and out and there was um, not a lot of resources out there. No, definitely not. No internet, uh, for sure. So you had to have these magazines. And so the advocate was a news magazine. Basically it was kind of like Newsweek for gay people. And so the, the people that I actually really looked up to, this is why I wanted to be a professional gay activist were like the people who was like, you know, the head of the human rights campaign or the head of Mm. the national gay and lesbian task force or whatever. And actually one thing that is really nice for me, it's like a, you know, a nice sort of closed circle in my life. Is it somebody that I used to read about years ago, all those years ago in the magazines? Um, was this guy named Rich Taffel, who I, I consider to be really a hero, like a very, very brave person. Um, he was the founder of log cabin Republicans, which is the, the gay Republican organization. And I mean, even now today, um, there's sort of persona non grata in much of the Republican Party. Um, and But, you know, you're sort of deliberately setting yourself up there, right? Because a lot of gay people are like, a Republican, are you joking? And, all, you know, a lot of Republicans are like, really, a gay group, are you joking? And so you're kind of vilified by everybody. But Rich Even Taffel, better. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> Rich Taffel was the founder of this group. And mm. I feel like he performed such a, an important function in terms of moving moving the dialogue forward just being a useful voice in the debate even though it kind of put him at personal risk in terms of having a lot of people be Everyone mad at him, him a lot of the time yeah but anyway all these years later um we met at a conference and we became buddies wow. and now he's like one of my best friends that's amazing so i i really feel happy about that because he's wow. somebody that i've admired for more than two decades wow yeah thanks for sharing that what information were you craving then that you wanted to get out to the world and is it is it you think it's being communicated now or not oh i mean yeah just like anything on the internet i'm so mad they hadn't figured out like I mean, yes, the internet existed then, but like people didn't have it. Mm. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, my God, yeah, it's. I, I think it's it's just a, a world of difference that people can can connect with other folks that they can get um, tons of unbiased information about everything that they need. I mean, it's just totally a miracle. Um, so, yeah, it is. It is kind of an amazing historical inflection point that I'm not even forty, and yet I honestly believe i grew up in a pit in the dark ages <laughs> right right yeah and one thing when i was reading you know the you got your masters from a really young age too why theology you went to harvard divinity school right yeah yeah so why that, theology that was actually an early bonding thing with me and rich taffel as a matter of fact because oh. he he also has a master's degree from harvard divinity school oh, really yeah, yeah. So um, he's actually a legit minister, as a matter of fact. 
but um, I, I did not pursue that route. I took the academic degree. Um, but I was an undergraduate major in philosophy, yeah. and I had two goals for myself. One was that I really liked philosophy, and I felt like I would understand it better. I would understand issues of meaning in the world, issues of meaning in life better if I also understood theology. So I decided to continue mm. on and study that. Interesting. Um, the other thing actually was because of my early interest in activism, um, I was very interested in um, the political advocacy that was that was being uh, very, you know, the, the political muscles were being flexed very visibly at the time by the Christian coalition mm. and uh, other right wing political, religious political groups. And I wanted to understand more about the theological underpinnings of mm. their uh, political viewpoint. Yeah. So I thought that that would be an interesting thing to study. Yeah. You know, Dory, everything in your bio, when I read it, stands out. You know, when we're talking about spoke at Harvard, MIT, books. Um, how did the, I wanted to point uh, kind of zero on one, which is the Duke professor. How did that come about? So that actually came about because in 2002, I was the press secretary on a political campaign. Uh, it was when Robert Reich, who was the former U.S. Labor Secretary, ran for governor of Massachusetts. And so it was it was an unsuccessful race. Ultimately, the, the person who ended up being the governor uh, that year uh, went, went on to later fame, Mitt Romney. Uh, <laughs> but uh, so, so sadly, our, our candidate did not prevail. But um, anyway, on the campaign, I met this woman who, you know, had a relatively junior role. Uh, her name was Mita Malik, and she was the assistant to the uh, to the campaign manager. Really nice woman. She ended up going off to graduate school and getting her MBA at Duke. And I think a lot of times people think, oh, you know, gosh, break, you know, breaking in at different universities, it's so hard, it's so complicated. Yeah. And it is largely because it's a really o weird and opaque process. Yeah. But it doesn't necessarily have to, it's, it's hard because it's opaque, but it, yeah. it's not, it's not necessarily hard because you have to have special credentials or, or whatever. I don't have a doctorate. Yeah. You know, my, my degree, as you said, is in theology. Um, but so I told Mita, you know, we had sort of stayed in touch. And so yeah. years later we were just in touch and I mentioned to her casually that I wanted to start doing more business school teaching. Mm. I had done a little tiny bit, but not that much. Yeah. And she said, Oh, I should connect you to people at Duke. And I'm like, Oh, well that's, that's sweet. That you know? sounds great. <laughs> yeah. But you know, she, she didn't really know the people that I needed to talk to. The person that she had stayed touch, in touch with that she was really close to was the, like the admissions person. Okay, great. That's like not at all the person who can help me. But but she connected me to the admissions person who actually was very nice. And the admissions person then connected me to the person that I needed to talk to. Yeah. And it happened in that moment that um they had just they had just like gotten some feedback or whatever from their students that what they really wanted, what they really needed yeah. was the thing that had happened that I offered. Mm. And so they were super excited to talk to me and just kind of jumped on it, which was, which was great. Wow. And so, uh, um, what were you offering? What, what did you, what was your offering at the time? I mean, you know, basically, uh, it, you know, I, I was not necessarily coming to them with like a special thing, but it, yeah. I was just telling them my general credentials and yeah. what they were interested in was finding ways to help the students uh, with uh, public speaking and communications see. See. better. And uh, that, you know, which is something that I do. Right. And uh, so anyway, we uh, I've now been teaching for them for three, four years and wow. uh, have done a lot of different things for them. Yeah. Um, I teach an executive ed class now, kind of, kind of on similar lines called communication for leaders. Um, I, every year for the past three years, I've done a course for executive MBA students on yeah. marketing strategy. So we, uh, we just kind of ran with it. Right. Yeah. I'd be on the, on the phone with the, the professor hiring. Yeah. We're looking for this specialist thing. That's exactly what I specialize. <laughs> um, what's the most popular topic that you teach at this school? What do students um, love the most? Because I know you teach on a variety of topics. Yeah, yeah, I do. Um, that is a good question. I think um, if I was thinking about things that get people really excited, yeah. um, actually, you know, as part of communication for leaders, one one of the, the pieces of it that we do, you know, part of it is like oral communication skills, but we also do social media 
um, you know, specifically, you know, this is not social media for companies, although I actually do that in my marketing strategy class. Mm -hmm. But in communication for leaders, I do social media for individuals. Like, how do you how do you use it the right way to build your personal brand? And I think a lot of people like that and benefit from it because they they're worried about it. They know that they should be doing it. They yeah. know that it is useful and beneficial, but they're really not sure how. And they feel like it is very high stakes that yeah. they don't they can't afford to screw up and make a mistake. Um, so I think that combination makes them very excited about and appreciative of the help. Yeah. And, and Dory, with, with that story, I love, thank you for telling that. I love that story. And with that, with your friend, there's two concepts that you talk about a lot. Um, one is loose ties and the other is luck. And so they both seem to tie right into you getting, or, you know, seemingly getting the Duke professorship besides your, your background and all that, but getting the opportunity to, can you talk a little bit about loose ties and um, kind of how that plays a role and what people should be thinking about for that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, the basic idea, of course, is that um, we we run across people all the time. And when we when people talk about networking, the the thing that gets talked about the most, the sort of sexy part, quote unquote, of networking yeah. is meeting new people. Yeah. Um, but what often gets lost in translation is something that is e equally, if not more important, and that is staying in touch with the people that you already know. Um, otherwise, you know, they just kind of drain out of your life and it's sort of a waste. Mm -hmm. And so I um, so, yeah, getting getting in touch with with Mita, staying in touch with her was pretty, you know, pretty fantastic. It was, you know, a lucky thing. But I think that something that, that does become important, especially as you spend more time in the professional world, meet more people, have more connections, it stops being something your brain can do. And so having a contact management system that enables you to track contacts and, and just have an external reminder of who you ought to be staying in touch with yeah. is important. Because otherwise, even if the people really are important, you just you cognitively can't do it. It's It's too many. I mean, in my database now, I have, I mean... You know, my email list is like 25,000, but just in terms of my personal database of like people I know right. is like 10,000. I mean, yeah. like, there's no way I could keep on top of that and be like, oh, I really should have emailed so and so. Right. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And then what about the luck factor? I know you talk about luck and there's two attributes um, that, and there's a book that you reference too with luck that, that people should maybe check out as well. Yeah, yeah. There's a there's a good book that came out a few years ago called Heart Smarts Guts and Luck by mm. um, Anthony Chan. He spells it T J A N, and uh, a couple of his colleagues. And it's uh, it's a great book about what makes entrepreneurs successful. Yeah. And they kind of break people down into this typology of four different types. Uh, there's heart driven leaders, smarts guts and then luck driven leaders and it was it was always the last one that i thought was a little weird like you know what does it mean to be a luck driven yeah, leader yeah. if you know the, the popular definition yeah. of luck is just something that like happens to you that you can't control but the interesting thing that he talks about in the book is that there are factors that it turns out you actually you know kind of can control and the two that you're alluding to are curiosity and humility. Right. And when people have those traits, which are things that can actually be developed and can actually be worked on, right. then you are more willing and open to connecting with different types of people. You know, it's, it's, not, it's not lucky. Like almost definitionally, it's not lucky right. if I'm like, I really want to meet Jeremy. And then I go up and introduce myself and then we have a conversation <laughs> and then something good happens. Right, right. Like that, that's not luck. That's actually my plan <laughs> is to meet Jeremy. But if I'm, you know, standing like late for my bus and I strike up a conversation with you yeah. and we chit chat and then, oh my gosh, wow, you're Jeremy. I've been yeah. wanting to meet Jeremy yeah. a long time. Or, oh, right. you're Jeremy's brother. That's amazing. Can you introduce us? <laughs> that's luck. Yeah. And it comes from that willingness to yeah. just take a chance, talk to people, see where it goes. Yeah. And people should check out Stand Out. All this is in depth. And my fav one of my favorite stories is with you and Craigslist. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that, that was good luck. Absolutely. Um, so basically, I had been trying for a really long time to... Um, to break in and start blogging for different publications. Right. And 
you know, I, I had pitched a million places and, you know, a lot of these people were just dicks and not getting back to me. <laughs> and uh, so I wasn't having a lot of luck, but I ended up selling my bike on Craigslist and it turned out this is I was the best living story. Do I love this? Yeah. Oh, yeah. thank you. Yeah. I was living in the Boston area and, uh, and I was trying to be responsible. I wanted to buy a new bike, but I'm like, Dory, you should not buy a new bike until you sell your old bike. <laughs> so, uh, so I did it. I put it out and it turned out the woman that I sold my bike to worked for the Harvard business review. And so I, uh, I, when she told me that I was like, Oh, I'm like, how do you start blogging for HBR? And she was not the right person, but she was willing to introduce me to the person who was. Yeah. And um, and so it, it worked out, and I was able to start getting my blogs published there. And um, yeah. then, you know, the blog, the, one of the first blog posts that I did was called uh, How to Reinvent Your Personal Brand. And it got, uh, they asked me if I would turn it into a magazine piece. Right. And then from the magazine piece, I had several literary agents approach me and ask if I was interested yeah. in turning it into a book. And so that yeah. is how Reinventing You happened. Yeah. And I wanted to go back a step for a second. And you weren't always the author we see today. Talk about some of the rejections you got before Reinventing You. Yeah. So I had um, I had actually written three book proposals, which had been uh, rejected. Yeah. And um, the, the, the common denominator in the rejection was that my, you know, the, my so-called platform, as they say, i.e. how famous you are, was, uh, famous, was, right? yeah. Yeah, was not sufficient for yeah. their needs. Uh, because, you know, ba basically I, what I came to realize too late after writing these proposals is that book publishers are extraordinarily risk averse and yeah. they don't want to take a chance on you. They, yeah. they just don't. The way that they minimize risk is that they want to work with people who have what they believe to be a built-in audience that will just automatically buy the book and then whatever they sell on top of that is gravy. And so I did not have a built-in audience. Right. I was under the mistaken kind of old school impression like, oh, I'll just write a really good proposal and then they'll help me sell it. Yeah. And you know, anyone who is who is under that uh, impression is uh, sadly we'll shatter sadly their dreams deluded. right now. We yes. will. We'll make them cry. <laughs> so you got a bunch of rejections, and so what did you then do to help build your your audience? So for me, the 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 logical thing because I had been a reporter before yeah. Yeah. Um, was I I said all right well what I need to do to start building my profile is blogging yeah. um, and there, there's a lot of possibilities that people could do I mean especially yeah. these days you could do podcasting you could do videos you could um, you know just get big on Instagram you know there's there's many things right. but the one that I chose was blogging and yeah. so specifically I wanted. You know, you you can establish your own blog, but I thought it would be a faster route for me since the yeah. book was my goal to try to write for publications Leverage that already other had a audiences. built in audiences. Yeah, yeah. yeah. very smart. So yeah. that was why I was in the process of trying to connect with larger publications and then finally was able to break in at HBR. Yeah, very smart. You're like, I'm not gonna just post it myself, but but really go right to where people already have audiences. What um, so did the reinventing you article give the get the big uh, most traction? Would you say it's, it got or a lot? It, yeah, it got a lot of traction. But I also helped it uh, because they had they had told me they'd given me it was like the second post I had ever done. Yeah, and wow. okay. for them, and they had told me that they really liked comments. That you know, at the time, mm. I don't think this is really the case anymore. But at the time, they were really obsessed with comments yeah. as a metric of yeah. success. So which I'm is, like, which I can see that it's engagement. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So I'm like, all right, I'm going to max that out. So, uh, so basically what I did, which is probably a little bit more than most authors, uh, would, would be willing to do. And I did this for months. I mean, every time I published for HBR for, I don't know, probably the first six months that I was doing it, yeah. what I would do is, you know, they'd tell you when it was going to go live and the, the minute it went live, I would start emailing and calling everybody that I knew. Mm. And I'd be like, I need you to comment on it now. I need you to fucking do it now. <laughs> and, and you so, use that. That should be your subject in the email. 
do it fucking now. <laughs> that's right. That's right. And so, um, like about a year ago, they updated the site, so so they lost a lot of the original comments, and so now I don't think you can see it. But but you know, I managed to get I don't know at least fifty, maybe a hundred wow, comments on it. Yeah, because basically I was working the phones for like four four hours yeah. just consecutively. Yeah. You know, really calling everybody, asking everybody yeah. for favors to do it. Yeah. And so you know, it meant consequently um, that. You know, it, it stayed at the top of the list because at the time, the way that the site interface was, um, was they would say, like, what's trending, you know, what's most commented. Right, right. So that meant more people would see it over a period of days and then it would build organically. Right. So they looked at it and, you know, I, I think they thought that the content was good, um, but they also were like, whoa, this is getting lots of comments. <laughs> right. You know, I love hearing that story because people think, oh, even when you get to that point to write for Harvard Business Review or Forbes or whatever, you're still hustling and making sure that it trends and gets to the top of whatever you know uh you know platform it's on so yes thank you for sharing that and demystifying like yeah you just put it out there and it goes viral it's not the case um i want to hear about the brainstorming process a little bit and how did you first decide it was time for another book stand out i you know it wasn't uh it wasn't a hard process for me to decide that okay. i actually I actually tried to sell the manuscript for Standout even before oh, really? um, Reinventing You was published. I was, I was, because there's a big gap, you know, between when you finish a book and when it comes out. So I, you know, I had time. And so I wrote the second proposal and I wanted to sell it, but yeah. no one would buy it because they said, no, we need to see how your they first book. They want to wait. Yeah. yeah. They all want to wait and see how successful it is because they're cowardly motherfuckers. <laughs> and, and they just, they, you know, they won't take any chances. <laughs> So that's just what you're dealing with. What made you decide to do that topic stand out? Because um, you so, could write on a slew of topics. I'm sure you've had a slew of successful blog posts that could, you know, turn into articles and then books. Why that one? Yeah. So I wanted to do stand out basically because, at, you know, for for that book and also the the one that I'm working on now. Yeah. Can you I, talk about that one or is yeah, that under yeah, wraps? Sure. Okay. I, um, I wanted to, I essentially wanted to have an official excuse or a rationale for doing research and doing the interviews that I wanted to do so that I could learn myself. I see. I wanted, I wanted to solve my own problem. That's perfect. I love it. Yeah. And so for Stand Out, this is a book for people who are very much in my situation. You know, they're, they're professionals who like what they're doing, you know, they like their job or they like their career but they want to somehow figure out how to get recognized as being among the best in their field. And they, they need to, um, to crack that code. And so I wanted, I figured, okay, if I talk to people who really are successful, who are among the most successful in their right. field, um, I, I want to figure out their secrets and yeah. try to, you know, deconstruct them and then create a roadmap for people so that, so that they can, um, hopefully follow that in order to get their best ideas recognized as well. Yeah, I like how you include the super famous people and then the, I won't call John regular, but you know, compared to Robert Cialdini at this point, John will probably yes. become that someday. Um, but so who's one of your favorite examples who stood out to you in when you were researching Stand Out? And I want to hear one that's in the book and then one of your favorites and then also one that maybe didn't make the book because obviously you can't include everything. What was one that was in that's your personal, one of the personal favorites? Yeah, well, you know, one one person who I included, um, and it made me happy to be able to include him, yeah. is a guy that I know named Robbie Samuels mm -hmm. in Boston. And um, he was included in the book because he created a, uh, a group called Socializing for Justice. Mm -hmm. And basically what this is, is he had this problem he wanted to solve, which is at the time he was working at a nonprofit and he felt like a lot of the, the, the nonprofit community was fragmented. And yeah. people could be learning from each other, but they just, they all had their heads down. They were too busy. They were all doing their own individual thing. And he's like, people, if we share best practices, we could be so much better. We right. could learn so much. And right. they're all like, yeah, Robbie, we know, but we're too busy. And it just wasn't happening. And so what he did was come up basically with a really brilliant way to trick people. <laughs> and so I love it. Let's hear it. Yeah. He, cr he created a meetup group um, called Socializing for Justice. And he realized that he had been trying to feed them, you know, spinach. Like, oh, come, let's have a meeting and trade best practices. And they're like, no, we can't do that. 
And instead, he, he decided to feed them pizza. And he, so he created Socializing for Justice, which is a, like a fun meetup, purely fun. And they'd have activities mm. every other week, like bowling for justice and cocktails for justice and trivia night for justice. Right. And it was stuff that people wanted to do. Yeah. And so, you know, the, the hook is like, oh, come meet other people in the nonprofit community doing fun things like bowling. Mm. And so people flocked to it. Yeah. And the thing that he wanted to happen anyway, you know, get to know each other, trade best practices, right. connect, it was you know, a byproduct. join up. Yeah. It was a byproduct of it. And so it became so successful. The group is now nearly a decade old. Wow. It has 3,000 members. Yeah. And he was able to actually use it. He, he built such a robust network. He has been able subsequently to go out on his own and become a, a consultant um, and have his own business on the strength of all the connections and relationships yeah. that he's built. Yeah. And there are so many good stories like that in Standout, um, which we don't have time to mention. But um, like the one who basically giving access to the internet to really poverty stricken areas. So people, if they want to listen to that one, they'll have to get stand out. But um, what about one that wasn't in the book that was powerful in your research? Cause I know you do tons of research and not everything makes it in. Yeah. You know, actually the interesting thing, Jeremy, is that one of my secrets for, um, for writing the book is that I tried to be, like super meticulous in the proposal phase mm -hmm. about coming up with exactly what I wanted to include. Yeah. And part of the reason that I was able to write it really fast, um, I mean, the, the, from the time I signed the contract to the time it came out was 18 months, which actually in publishing is like crazy fast. You right. Know? Yeah. Um, but, but the actual writing of the first draft, I was able, like I researched it for a couple of months. I wrote it, you know, in a couple of months, but, but it, it went very rapidly. And part of it was that I basically did the intellectual heavy lifting in the proposal phase. Mm. So did um, the planning. Yeah. So, so actually there's not a lot of material that wow. didn't make it in the book. Um, from the proposal, y you need to have a pretty fleshed out idea of exactly what you want to do. And so it really just became uh, interviewing and executing at that point. Got it. So you were so prepared that everyone that you interviewed and did research on, it was included. Um, so what about, what was good advice you received from a mentor or colleague while you were completing the book that was beneficial? So let's see, in terms of, in terms of, uh, you know, book, the book and, uh, you know, wh what I was doing at the time, I mean, um, certainly, you know, something that, that has been very, uh, successful for me, you know, the, the, um, document that you were kind enough to mention at the start of um of our session together the uh the standout self-assessment workbook yeah, yeah that was actually really critical um yeah talk and about I, that yeah. I, I heard from uh from a number of other authors that was u useful and there's a guy named uh rob eager who wrote a book I, that i actually interviewed him about for uh, uh my forbes blog um, his book is called uh, something like "Sell Your Book Like Wildfire," mm. and he's he's a book Every author marketing wants specialist. To read that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And he he talks about you know really that it's important to have a giveaway like that. Yeah. The reason for that is that it becomes a list building tool, and if you give people something that is of real interest and real value, they will sign up for it. They will get it, and then okay, so they you know they opt in um, through getting that to your email list, and of course they can unsubscribe at any point if they don't like it. But the idea is that you have started a relationship with them, and by the time they look at the first thing you send, the second thing you send, they're like, oh, this is actually really great. Yeah, I like getting these. Whereas they probably would not give you a chance if you yeah. were just like, you know, join my newsletter, which yeah. sounds awfully boring. And so over yeah. the course of um, the book launch, uh, so between February and like October, um, you know, so like a 10, you know, nine, 10 month period, I was able to more than double my um, my email list. Wow. I uh, you know now I went from under ten thousand to now twenty five thousand. That's amazing. Yeah. So that that was really a key driver for me. What made you decide on the self assessment, um, which seems like a lot of work, which is very valuable, as opposed to like a free chapter, which wouldn't be as much work. That would you know what I mean? Yeah. 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 So I'm so curious I on your thought process behind that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, so so for one, um, I mean, it's just a question of like what's more exciting for people. Yeah. I mean, a free chapter is nice, but it's like it kind of ain't all that, you know. I mean, people are, are so you wanted used something to, that. to go above and beyond. 
yeah, you you want something that people will actually be like, oh yeah, I actually want that. I can use that. That will be interesting. But but to tell the truth, it actually was not that much work for me because mm. one of the things that I learned in writing Reinventing You, my first book, was uh, you know I, my editor told me to do this, and I was like, really? Like I thought it was kind of silly. I thought it was like a throwaway. He's like, at the end of each chapter, can you like put these like ask yourself questions? And I'm like, oh, whatever, you know, and I did it because he suggested it, but I didn't think it was a big deal. Mm -hmm. But I heard from so many people mm -hmm. that that was what they really liked, wow. you know, that that was really beneficial That's to amazing. them in terms of their reflection. I'm like, oh, yeah. I guess he knew something I didn't. <laughs> I guess I, he knew what he was talking about. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, so I made a point of doing that in Stand Out. Mm. And in fact, I made a point of like maxing out on it in Stand Out, basically. I'm like, all right, if people like these questions, I'll, I'll totally do questions. And so I, I put at the end of each uh, chapter, I put, or actually even each section of each chapter, yeah. I did lots of like ask yourself questions. And so for the self-assessment, basically what I did was I just gathered all the questions in one place. Yeah. And it turns out there's a lot of questions. There were 139 questions. Wow. Um, but, you know, as you're reading in a book, like, yeah, you can kind of ask yourself those questions, but it's not really like the time or place for yeah. deep reflection. I'm in the car listening going. to you on Audible. I can't yeah, jot down notes. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So what I did for the self-assessment is basically just grab those questions. You know, I grabbed each of them from the, from the end of the chapters, put them together, gave it to my publisher. And mm. I said, can you have a designer make this look really nice? Yeah. And they did. And, and I made sure that after each question, there was room to write so that people could actually use yeah. it like a workbook, that it yeah. would be like a really helpful tool. So it's this beautifully designed, helpful workbook, yeah. but it didn't require new work. It's stuff adapted from the book, yeah. but it's just in a user-friendly format that, I mean, yeah, people could make that on their own, but it would take them so much time. It just wouldn't be worth it. So down, downloading it um, off my website is you know, hopefully a pretty easy and helpful thing that will enable them to make better use of it. For sure. So, Dory, who do you consider your mentors? So, it's a, it's a really good question. I mean, I, I'm a big fan of the, um, you know, a sort of broader definition of, of, uh, of mentor. I mean, yeah. I think something I talk about a lot in Reinventing You is yeah. that I think too often people fixate on, like, one person. It's right. like, oh, this and, and that's hard. That's a really hard situation yeah. um, because a lot of people don't have like the one person. Right, right. So I like to think of it as kind of more of a group model. Like who do I want to learn from on multiple counts? So I, ha I definitely have a lot of friends that I, that I turn to for advice about certain things and also different communities that I'm part of. Mm -hmm. um, John and I, for instance, are, are part of, uh, you know, this group, maybe you are too. I'm not even, I'm not even sure, but um, it's, uh, it's a group called Joint Venture Mastermind mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, that a guy named Dove Gordon started. Yes, yes. And so, you know, just like a list of trading ideas. That's a, that's a form of kind of mutual right, mentoring. Right. Um, so I, I think that that's really valuable. I have groups that I've, you know, that I've started like uh, here in New York, a friend of mine named Jenny Blake, um, who's a fellow career author, we decided to start a uh, kind of women's professional group mm -hmm. and uh, have been meeting every other month with that. And that's that's been really great. Yeah. So just kind of yeah. bringing together a lot of people for interesting ideas. Yeah. So and the other question I wanted to ask you is about a lesson you learned from consulting. You consulted with huge companies, Google, Microsoft, Morgan Stanley. What's um, What does that client work look like? What uh, What's a lesson we should all learn from when you worked at work with Google or Microsoft or one of those companies? Yeah, well, I think, you know, one of the biggest lessons is that it's, you know, you're always still selling to individuals and mm -hmm. the process of, of selling into a big company is, I mean, there may be more hurdles just in terms of like the contracting, mm -hmm. but in fundamentally the process is the same as selling to, you know, a local small business owner. It's just yeah. a relationship with a person. Yeah. And so, you know, my original connection with Google actually was, um, was through a woman that I worked with on a political campaign. And uh, Google needed somebody to help with a certain project that they were working on. And they asked her. And, mm. she, you know, we had worked together on a campaign. She knew I could do stuff like that. And she said, well, how about Dory? Yeah. And, uh, and so as a result, um, I, was, I was able to get that, that early contract, yeah. which really, you know, made a big difference for my business. Yeah, that's amazing. You know, Dory, since it's Inspired Insider, I always ask the question, uh, what's been the lowest point in your career 
And then on the flip side, what's been the proudest moment? What's been the lowest point and then how you push through that first? Yeah. So one low point, I guess, um, maybe maybe the lowest point was uh, actually right right before my first book came out, I um, I ended up having this like really terrible breakup with a girlfriend mm. and I had moved to New York for her slash with her and then we like immediately broke up and so then I had to I had to move back to Boston mm, and I missed her a lot but I was also like incredibly angry at her because she had made things very very hard and difficult for me yeah. and so it was just like this terrible tug of emotions I felt you know really lonely about the end of this relationship yeah. and I had to market my book while I was doing it and that's not it, the the best mindset to be in when you're pushing off one of your, your your huge books yeah yeah so so i just i felt like i mean i, I couldn't even sleep i was you know yeah. kind of such a wreck so yeah so it was it was very hard because there were things that i needed to do and and it was it was just really hard emotionally to be able yeah. to do them how do you push through that you know this is the real stuff to i love to hear about because Life is happening, and you know we just talk about business stuff. But someone has a death in the family; they have a breakup. There's stuff going on, illness or something like that, and we are having to kind of just push ahead in business despite all this other stuff going around us. What did you do? How'd you, you know, push forward at that time? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that um, in terms of, I, I don't, I don't know that I necessarily had a lot of really great strategies i actually yeah. i thought about seeing a therapist and then yeah. i realized i was too busy i was literally like i don't have time i don't have time to see a therapist okay yeah. and so <laughs> therapy and so is didn't. taking your gets your mind you're too busy to get your mind off of what your pain is <laughs> <laughs> that's right yeah so um so yeah i mean i guess i guess you know it's it, like in the sort of only way in is through kind of thing i would um i would basically just I guess, I guess my, you know, you can argue about its level of adaptability, but my way yeah. through it was just working harder. Yeah. And, um, and so I was crying every day. I mean, wow. every single day I was crying, but, um, but I just, I just worked like a maniac and yeah. eventually, you know, I think, I think if you keep doing that forever, it's not good. But mm -hmm. I think sometimes if you're sort of in a, in an acute phase, um, actually distracting yourself through whatever means, you know, and I think work is better than, some of the alternatives of distracting right. oneself. Yes, yes. Um, if if you can distract yourself long enough, yeah. then you're actually in a better position to be able to, you know, sort of recover and, and be okay. Yeah, because I'm sure someone listening to this or watching this is going through something in their life and, you know, and trying to push through to whatever they're trying to do. Um, so, you know, I appreciate you sharing that. And then on the flip side, um, the proudest moment. Yeah. So the proudest moment, um, gosh, there's, uh, there's been a lot of, a lot of really fun things that I feel, I feel excited about. Um, I mean, you know, giving, giving my first, uh, authors at Google talk was really I saw fun that. for yeah. me. That was, uh, that was, you know, really great. Um, you know, that cause I had watched plenty of them before. And yeah. so getting to, to do my own was a really nice feeling. Yeah. Um, I, you know, certainly seeing my books, you know, having them out there was really cool. I mean, actually just, just one that just happened that was pretty yeah. neat was, um, was Inc. Magazine named my book, uh, stand out the number one leadership book of 2015. Holy cow. So that was really cool. That's amazing. Congratulations. Yeah, thank you. What about, um, you know, I was looking on Amazon and I got, you know, Stand Out and Reinventing You on Audible, but I saw Stand Out Networking. Yeah. So is that fairly new or is that, was that, yeah, tell me about that. I, so it's an ebook. It's a yeah, short, you know, like Kindle. 60, 60 yeah. page ebook. Um, I released that, I, you know, mostly because I'm a maniac, but I, uh, yeah. I, I released it about a month after Stand Out came out. I just I thought as like, you know, oh, like it is an experiment. Yeah. Um, there's probably going to be some people that have discovered uh, my work through yeah. through Stand Out. And yeah. so why not create a yeah. sort of follow on product for yeah. them? So I that agree. was the idea. I thought I saw it. And I'm like, Dory, genius. Genius. There should be Stand Out <laughs> Networking, Stand Out this. Stand I have written down in my notes like before i saw that which is what's the most important context for standing out and then i saw stand out networking and i'm like dory's a genius yeah that's for sure there could be a branch of any stand out 
you know, avenue. So yeah, yeah I love that. Um, Dory, this has been hugely valuable. I really appreciate your time. And what final words should we share about standout that we haven't talked about and then just tell people where they should check out, check you out and everything. Yeah. Thank you so much, Jeremy. I appreciate you uh, taking the time to chat. Yeah. I mean, in terms of in terms of standout, I would say that, um, you know, one one of the, the mantras that I actually really like from it, um, having interviewed David Allen, the, you know, getting things done fame. Yeah. One of the quotes that he said that that I, I feel like is one of the best nuggets from standout is he said it doesn't take time to have a great idea. It takes space. And, you know, if we think about this idea, if our goal is to have breakthrough ideas, how do you best do it? Well, it's it's not like, oh, I need to go into the woods for six months and then I'll have a really great idea. Right. It's it's just finding ways to create mental space in your life so that your brain is free yeah. to be able to make connections and have interesting thoughts. Right. And the more we can do that, you know, the more we can leave white space in our days, yeah. um, the more we can say no to um, pushing ourselves endlessly and ceaselessly, I think mm. the better off we'll be. Yeah. How do you create mental space? Well, so because you so seem from, like a push, 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 just go. <laughs> yeah, I do a lot of. So it. I it's need true. your advice on this too. So go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Well, actually, you know, one of the one of the things that that I'm really excited about is yeah. um, for the last month of the year, you know, for for now on, basically, I got yeah. back yesterday from San Francisco, yeah. so I'm not traveling until the end of the year, and I actually am not. Uh, taking meetings most most of December. I have like maybe one or two days per week that I'm doing yeah, it, yeah. but I've actually reserved the rest of the time for longer term projects like course development and things like that. Mm -hmm. So just putting in your schedule, make sure yeah. it happens. Yeah, exactly. So where should we point people towards? Where should they check out, Dory? Yeah, thank you. So uh, so I would just uh, send them to, uh, to doryclark.com um, th where they can get the... D-O-R-I-E-C-L-A-R-K. You yeah. got it. Exactly. They can get the standout workbook. They can get, there's 400 free articles on the site. So yeah. I hope people can find some stuff they might like. Fantastic. Dory, thank you so much. Hugely valuable. Everyone should check out Standout, Reinventing You, doryclark.com. Really appreciate it, Dory. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Jeremy. Appreciate it. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other if you find the same right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand